My name is Thomas Petrozelli. Uh, I started RCA in August of 1950. Uh, I worked there for as an assembler first on a, a line where we were producing television sets. But my uh, goal was to be a tester at RCA, which I had already went to school for. I had went to a radio electronic institute in Philadelphia for an eight-month course in uh, radio and then television. And television was on the rise. And after that, I got a job with Motorola Corporation installing antennas with the hope of getting into the servicing field and repairing television sets. Well, after a, about two years with them, I realized there was no hope for me there. So I, I bailed out. And I went out and worked for uh, small businesses for television repair and servicing. Frankfurt uh, Radio and Gilbert Stern, different companies like that. And then I got married in 1951. And by chance, my brother-in-law, who was working at RCA, got me a job there. And I found out it was a family-oriented place. And the only way you could get in there, more or less, is you had to have a relative working there. And the place was loaded with relatives. <laughs> But at any rate, uh, after about a month on the assembly line, I, my upgrade came through and I became a Class A tester. And the uh, Class A tester did just exactly what I'm... We tested whatever we were given to test. And I wound up in 17 building. 17 building originally was the, the, the home of the Victor's Talking Machine country, company. And if you go there today, and the, at the entrance over the wall, in, engraved in stone, it still says Victor on it. And the tower, which was the, the graced the skyline of uh, Camden, had the, the, his logo on it, which was Nipper, the dog, listening to the, a record who was called His Master's Voice. That was worldwide. That was RCA's logo for a long period of time. They eventually changed it. And they put some, I don't know what you call it, space age lettering, <laughs> RCA, it said. Everybody in the plant, we shook our heads. We couldn't understand why they would let a valuable piece of, uh, of history get shelved. And those, those it was four, uh, uh, what do they call them, stained glass windows. They were round. And when they lit, the, lit it up at night, you really see Nipper listening to the record. Well, that was, I think one of them went to, the, to Washington, well, some institute in Washington that collects junk like that. Another one went somewhere else, another. So there was not too many, there was only four of them. So where they all wound up, later on it came back when, when they got rid of the space age lettering. But that originally was a, a factory to make cabinets for the Victor talking machine. And if you went inside the building, it had huge round columns in it, but they were hollow and they would force air through a vent. A vent. Uh, they had a washed air system on the roof where water poured over the screen and air was sucked down in to keep the humidity in the building high on account of wood, wood shavings and things like that, it's fire. So the whole building was a concrete building. But in the meantime, the, the talking machine was no longer made there, and so they used it for other manufacturing. So that's where I started my testing on the fourth floor. Under the name is Tom McIntyre was my supervisor. A good man. And... Uh, I, I spent at least 20 years in the commercial end of the business before I got into the, the government. And during that time, I worked for uh, what was mobile communications. Uh, that was a, a transceiver used for uh, radio for uh, fire and police. And we sold them all over the country. And then also, uh, I got involved in uh, Radio Marine 
It came from New York. It was a, something that wasn't basically a Camden thing. And uh, a guy by the name of Charlie Anzalone was the boss. And he, uh, we got along famously, and I worked on navigational radar and, uh, I, like, what did I say, uh, microwave transmitters. And then from there, that job completed, and then I was put on another job for AT&T. It was a microwave relay system that would go around the country, and they get all their communication for AT&T. And after that completed, uh, what else did I do? Oh, uh, I wound up getting, uh, doing a layoff, I wound up in uh, one building, which was originally the building that housed them, where they made records. And at one time, Camden was the, the hub for uh, records because of the talking machine. They needed talk records for talking machine. They even came out with the 45. Just They practically gave the, the, the instrument away just so you could buy the records. So uh, it was interesting to growing up through that. I never saw records there, but I did, I did get down into the, the kilns where they kept the master copies, and those kilns were kept at temperatures over 100 degrees to keep those uh, master copies from warping. And it's still, they, the building still could be there. It's down along the river. And we did, uh, after that I came back and I worked on uh, mainframe computer, and then what else? Uh, I, I spent about, like I said, about 20 years in the commercial end of the business. And then after that, I wound up in three buildings where I got involved in more government contracts. And being I had a top secret clearance, I was welcome there. <laughs> they didn't have to train me on so at any rate, I worked on a P3C radio. It was a transceiver. And I, I, my particular job was just a receiver. Uh, somebody else did uh, other transmitters. Other people made modules that went into the receiver. But I was the one who finished the, the receiver and said, it's OK to go and, and install it together as a package. After the, the PC3, I got involved in Trident. The Trident radio went into the warhead of the, the rocket, and all it did was it was used telemetry to let the people who were testing the rockets what was happening while it was flying downrange. It even had a self-destruct button on it in case the thing went off course and rather than hit something valuable, they just blow it up in the air. But uh, that was interesting. I mean, it, it was computerized testing. We we had a, a setup where we just installed the radio and we did test by just by flipping different switches. And but as if it, when it came to troubleshooting, that's where the problem lied. With that, we had to be able to jump into where we were without disturbing the rest of the test. If not, you'd have to go back to square one and start at the beginning. So we had to find shortcuts out how to do that, and we did. After that, I got involved in the Apollo 17 project, and that was building the LEM radio. And the LEM radio proved to be a very valuable piece of equipment because it was communication between the lunar module and the spacecraft, and it also had a ranging system which could be used as in, if they needed as radar. And uh, we did that with environmental testing, and we got through that. And uh, like I said before, uh, one of the most memorable bosses I ever had in RCA was named Frank Spira. <laughs> I hope he hears it someday. Uh, Frank was a, a very nice boss, and we worked together as a team, and we, we got through that job. Then I was transferred to uh, a, uh, it was called a shelter. It's a microwave, a tropospheric shelter that 
and it was made for the military. And that's when uh, that's where I completed my uh, tour of duty with RCA. And then 1987, I retired and I went on with my life. But I, I'll have to say this about RCA: it was a great place to work. I loved my job. I liked to. I used to. I used to try. I couldn't wait to get to work. That's how good it was. <laughs> we had a good night shift, and we were practically on our own. There was. Not too many guys on the night shift, so it was like a skeleton crew, and we handled everything ourselves. Didn't require a supervisor, and they didn't put one on because it cost money. So <laughs> we, we had a good time, and, uh, and some experiences I had were funny. I mean, uh, we, we did some things, and but uh, as a rule, I think most people were happy to work for RCA. RCA was a great company to work for, and maybe today it is. I mean, I, I know there's still a, a, some some work being done in Camden, but it's more or less to keep Camden alive than to keep RCA alive. Uh, I know there's one young fellow I left, uh, his, he was a supervisor and a personal friend of mine. Uh, his name was Joe, who I, I have to think what his last name is. Joe Locastro, and uh, he was, when I was leaving, I was like uh, 60 years old, and, and uh, he was about in his 30s. So he still might be down there in Camden, I don't know. Do you have any stories with any supervisors or coworkers that particularly stick out in your mind? Well, like I said, with Frank Spear, it, it was like, well, like sometimes Frank would say to me, Tom, come with me. I said, where are we going? He says, we're going to lunch. <laughs> and we go outside and we discuss the job. And he say, you know, I know those, those other guys don't know as much as you, but he said, try to help them out. I said, yeah, I always do. So, <laughs> yeah, you keep quiet, Rocco. <laughs> So one one time we we were out and I, for some reason or other he he was running a business outside of RCA he had a, a like a, a a tap room or a restaurant I forget which but every once in a while somebody would say say hey Frank you need rolls and there was this guy named Art Boas he he was another ex tester. He'd go out and get rolls for, for Frank's business. It was kind of stupid, but uh, it all worked out in the end. And it was really a good, a good thing. And sometimes uh, I met a lot of nice people in RCA. RCA, had, as, as far as like, we, we had a motto. Like when we were when we were working in, uh, I was working in uh, when that AT and T project, you know, and we had a motto like, uh, "Let's do it right the first time," because the the worst thing that could happen is we lose the customer, and that was a motto amongst just workers, and we all tried to keep up with that, and like I said, there was a lot of guys there. They were rare. I mean, <laughs> there was one fellow. We used to sit in the morning before the work would start at my boss's desk. And his name was Bill Kennedy. He was a young guy like me and, uh, then. And uh, with me and this guy, Al Gusman, were sitting next to his bench. And uh, this man comes walking by, and somebody knew him. And they said, hey, Bill, how are you? He said, fine. And he said, how you doing? He said, oh, we went fishing uh, last week, and uh, we got some codfish. So <laughs> every, this guy, Billy Belcher, overheard the conversation. So every morning when this guy would walk by, this Billy Belcher would say, did you go fishing over the weekend? And the guy said, no, we didn't go over the weekend. So one day we're, we're sitting there, and... I looked down the, near where the elevator comes in, 
and here comes this man again, and he's walking down towards our way, and this guy, Al Gusman, says to me, codfish. Well, we must stop laughing, because we knew in the minute he got near Billy, Billy was going to ask him to, about going fishing. One day I was walking towards my car at the end of the day, and it was down under, underneath the, the Delaware Bridge. There was a parking. And this man was ahead of me. And I walked up behind him and I said, are you going fishing today? <laughs> and he looked at me and he laughed. He said, you know what? He said, I offered that guy to go fishing. He said, but he told me he doesn't like to go fishing. Well, every, we all laughed about that. Another time in three building, we had a guy who was a sweeper. And he was deaf, and anybody would walk in, he was, they, they would say, like, where's so-and-so? And he'd say, fine, how's yourself? And, and every, somebody picked up on it, and any time somebody said something, somebody would say, oh, how's yourself? And, and you keep quiet. Do you have any kind of final thoughts to wrap up your experience at RCA overall, how it was? Well, it was more like family there. Uh, people, you know, we knew each other and, and like, uh, it was a very homey place to work. Uh, the bosses had all mellowed over the years. You know, at first they were strict and whatnot, but after you work with a guy 10, 20 years, you, you, you lose that, you know. Like, we used to call him Mr. McIntyre, but at the end there was a No, no, you calm down, shh, shh. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he, he, he was a good boss, Mr. McIntyre. And he was, he was around for a long while. And, like I said, there's... There were so many things that happened over the years, I can't really remember. But, but uh, like I said, it was a great place to work. If I could go back here right now, I would, because, but my eyesight is no longer, I, I'm out of the electronic business. I do, I do other things. I, I write, you know, learning to play the banjo, the banjo, the mandolin, and, uh, I try to keep active mentally. I write, I write for a website, and I have good memories of RCA. I know it. It was one one sure thing. I always remember Camden. Camden was a beautiful town at one time. You know, a lot of things happened in Camden, but today it doesn't work out that way. Do you have any memories of RCA after hours, anything you would do after work with people? Well, after my wife died, uh, I was taking my pulse <laughs> in my room, in, in, in my, where, I was, where I was testing the radio, and I noticed that I, I had skipped a beat. And I went to the nurse and I said, I, said, uh, I think I, my, uh, my heart's missing a beat. She said, how do you know? I said, I was taking my pulse. So she hollers over to the other nurse, hey, Julie, we got another one. <laughs> so she says, let me feel it. So she said, you're right. I said, well, what is it? He said, do you want to speak to the doctor? I said, sure. So the doctor came out and he asked me the same question. Well, why did I ever check my pulse? I said, well, I often, I often do that just to see if everything's okay. <laughs> he said, we have a sympathetic nervous system. He says, you can create your own problems. He said, just, you do have a slight, he said, but it's nothing to worry about. He said, but uh, don't take your pulse anymore. <laughs> but then she also got me involved in square dancing because she realized I, I had just lost my wife, and uh, I was, I was depressed, and I, I think that like like I said, it was a family type place, you know. Everybody took care of one another. Um, how did RCA reach into other parts of your life? What was that again? How did RCA reach into other parts of your life outside of work? 
How did RCA reach into your life outside of work? Well, it really didn't because I'll tell you, like to tell you the truth, I enjoyed my work so much that I I read, would rather be at work and be, than being home because I had well, first of all, I was around surrounded with some friends and that they, they bolstered me up and. I, after I got over the death of my wife, uh, the friendship even got better. Like one guy took me to the racetrack <laughs> he, before we went to work. And he, another guy, was, he was named Al Nago, and he was always telling stories. And we were working on a, a, a modem that fit into the shelter. A modem is a modulator, demodulator. And it was the heart of the shelter. Uh, it could enhance the, the, uh, a weak signal. It had a special little device that they had, engineering had made that would sample the signal and then try to build up on it. So if it was in a real, like maybe a noisy part of the, uh, uh, like where the level of the signal was so low, they would raise the level of the signal and it worked it work better. And that in itself was a, a pretty pretty piece of complex equipment to test. And the other things, the, the receiver part and the transmitter part, they were, they were normal. I mean, we, I was working one night and uh, they had a special uh, uh, antenna system that if the antenna ever collapsed, or and and the microwave was spewing out radiation. Uh, it would shut down. But one night when I was there, it didn't. And there was a a, a quality control man. His name was uh, what was his name? Saparito. And he he's sitting there watching me running through these tests. And he says, "Oh my God, I'm getting a big headache." And I said, well, take, take an aspirin. <laughs> and then I, for some reason, I checked the output of the antenna and it was disconnected. And I, I think I got radiated too, but we don't know. It never affected me. I did mention it to the engineers. And they, they said, you know, they, they, they looked into it and they, they put something where it would never happen again. But those are some of the things that you come into. We had a man get killed out in the 53 building. He was a worman. Uh, he, he, didn't, he didn't realize that the, uh, the grounding strap that grounded the, uh, the equipment wasn't in there. And so the, when, when the capacitors were charged up to maybe 25 million volts or something like that, and he just, he just thought, Put his hand in there, and that was the end of him. And it wasn't uh, well, that was about the the only death I ever heard there of RCA. He was a wireman. I worked out in fifty three building. That was transmitters too. That was commercial transmitters, the ones, like the ones you put on top of buildings and for WPTZ and all that. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. They sometimes talk about RCA changing South Jersey. Do you have any opinion there on RCA changing South Jersey? Oh yeah, RCA. Uh, at one time, uh, Camden was a, a, a thriving community, and uh, a lot of people lived in Camden. Uh, but uh, you know, over the years, they they moved out for one reason or another. There's too many poor people in Camden. That's what killed Camden. But Camden itself is a nice town. It's got brownstone. You can go there and look at brownstone buildings that you can't see anymore. Doctors used to have their offices right on Cooper and Market Street. You know, people, the professional people resided there. But that, that, as the, the, the town degraded, they all moved out. You know, that, that was Camden. But uh, at New York Shipyard and the RCA, Campbell Soup. Campbell Soup was a big manufacturer there. 
and they came out with the first tomato that you could be picked by a machine. And I called them rhinoceros, rhinoceros hide tomatoes. Of course, one time I was, I think I had a truck parked outside. I said, can I have some of your tomatoes? He said, yeah. I took a couple up. I couldn't even bite into them. <laughs> they were that thick, the, the, the skin on them. But when Campbell's Soup moved out, that was the death knell for uh, Camden. What about this neighborhood? Did you have other neighbors that worked for RCA? Yeah, I had some neighbors here that worked for RCA. But uh, the Morristown plant was separate from us. So they, they made it that way, for just for contract reasons. And they did the, well, that's another thing, Aegis. Aegis was a giant, it was, it was a, 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 not a giant, but it was a, a, a big antenna system that could, could pick up information from, no, from different uh, frequencies at the same time. And it fit inside a huge golf ball that, which they had out in Morristown. I don't know if you ever saw it. Well, that's no longer there. But when I was in Alaska, uh, after I retired, I saw one of those stations out there, and they were our first line of defense. They, they were stretched across Canada and the United States up there. And they would, they would be getting messages coming in from all over the world into those things, and they could detect whether they were Russian or not. And we were having the Cold War with Russia. Well, the Cold War started right after World War II. People don't realize that. But that's life. <laughs> I don't know what else I could add to it, except it was a memorable place for me. Uh, I always have that fond memory of RCA when I think about it. And at one time, the ferry used to, where their parking lot is now, a ferry used to come in there, and there were stores, and you could actually go home, take the ferry to Philadelphia, and that, that was many years ago. That one, that one, just I, they closed that down, I guess, in around the early 1950s. Okay, Tom. Thank well, you very much. We well, appreciate you uh, taking the time to do this, and as you said, you are part of history. Right. And, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll put this all together with, uh, with all the other all Right. I, 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 I think that I lived through some of the best times this country ever is going to see mm -hmm. uh, and as a kid and, and growing up and even into, even into World War II. I mean, World War II was a big experience for me. Uh, I didn't plan it that way, but that's the way it worked out.